when we started this class, one of the things we were doing when we were thinking about the origins of the zombie in North America in terms of storytelling is we were thinking about, very early on, Jeffrey Shank's work, Zombies uh, from the Pulps, a pretty good little book that summarizes the appearance of zombies or zombie-like creatures in a number of publications and basically the years leading up to um, the production of White Zombie. So we were thinking about stories from Weird Tales, we were thinking about stories, I guess specifically from H.P. Lovecraft, but also from others that were dealing with, you know, zombie-like beings. And we were thinking a little bit about, a little bit about how that related to, uh, you know, the early description of zombies in Magic Island and things like that. The importance of that conversation, I think, in terms of where we are right now, is that it establishes a pretty direct link between kind of prose storytelling and the zombie tradition which is something we have not thought about for a number of weeks. It's not that that wasn't continuing to happen. It's not that there weren't um, a, a series of zombie stories that continue to be published. We just haven't considered them in this class for reasons of time and perspective and efficiency and a number of other issues. It's not that they're not relevant or significant. It's just been a backstory to what we've been discussing. That is very relevant, though, to The Walking Dead. Okay, which we will now begin to think a little bit about in this course. The Walking Dead, of course, is now you know into multiple seasons, has become a pop culture phenomenon for for closing in here on a decade in the not too distant future. Um, and there's a lot to it. But one of the things we might notice at the very beginning of The Walking Dead is that this show comes to us from the comic book tradition, the graphic novel tradition, okay, um, it comes to us from the comics, essentially. Robert Kirkman um, and the others who are involved are, are comic book artists, comic book storytellers who come up with a story that is then adapted to television, okay, adapted to um, television uh, to a great deal of success. That's important for a number of reasons. It's not that The Walking Dead doesn't have um, the tradition of zombie movies in the background. It, it absolutely does, but it creates this new scenario in our society, which we haven't really thought about at all in this course, where we have this ongoing dialogue between a comic book version of a story and a television version of the story. Now, we haven't thought about comic book traditions in this class, and so I'm not going to load you with a bunch of information um, on comic book storytelling, comic book traditions here at the very end of the term. Suffice it to say that it has been a serious and significant part of how people have talked about The Walking Dead over the past five or six years. The sense that there's a television version of something, there's a comic book version of something, and people talk about how these things relate to each other. And that is, of course, a significant conversation because it relates to two different storytelling traditions and it shows us how things might coincide, how things might vary over time. I don't want to dismiss any of that, but what I would say is that one of the things we've been developing in this class is, is the broader story, the grander story on top of this all. So while it's very reasonable to say, you know, here's how the first, um, the first edition, uh, the first entry into The Walking Dead uh, either does or does not match up with the television show, all of that stuff itself is underneath this much broader story of the zombie and its representation in American popular culture, which is something that we've thought about a lot this semester. So we're pretty well informed heading into the film, television show, excuse me. I might make that mistake a few more times. I'll try to avoid it. When we're watching, it's hard to tell the difference anymore, uh, really. Um, uh, when we're watching something like The Walking Dead, um, particularly this opening episode, what I think you will see is probably a number of immediate references to zombies, kind of post Romero, but in particular, kind of post, you know, uh, 2000. Uh, it's really at the beginning of this. You'll see, you'll see Rick uh, wake up in a hospital and have to go stumbling outside of the hospital, and everybody appears to be gone. I mean, I don't know how you can watch that and not think about the opening of 28 Days Later, right? They're very similar. The location is different. Uh, we're in Georgia in one instance, and we're in we're in London in, in, in another. Uh, in 28 days later, but it's that essential kind of you know a human being waking up from a coma, trying to reconcile himself with the world. Although I guess the story doesn't even start that way. What it actually begins with is with an instance of crime, right? A, a, a chase scene 
that results in the wounding of Rick so that he goes into the hospital and is essentially asleep while all the chaos is starting to unfold around him. And one of the, re one of the things I might point out is that that's such a you know, predictable and important part of the zombie story. We don't think about it when we're watching it, but what's happening at the beginning of this television show is we're basically being kept from the knowledge of what it is that creates the zombie plague. And whether or not you've watched the Walking Dead television show, you know, I don't think I'm giving too much away when I say that they never, or they haven't yet, at least the, uh, from the point that I'm recording this video, they haven't learned in the television show the cause of the outbreak or the significance of the outbreak or indeed how this zombie outbreak is so different from other things we've seen in this course in terms of what zombies are and where it is zombies come from. One of the really devastating things the characters in the show learn is that zombieism, which they never refer to as zombieism, they call them walkers and different communities have different terms for these creatures, but they're essentially zombies. I think they fall pretty squarely under the description of zombies that we've seen kind of post body horror on. This is the body horror zombie in the post 9-11 world, right? So we have the fear of the uncontrollable invasion of the zombies unstoppable invasion of the zombies who are representing body horror as kind of a staff as it's kind of established in the early 1980s and then begins to affect you know and impact the Romero films and then a bunch of others some of which we've seen like 28 days later anyway the problem isn't just that they're zombies and the problem isn't just that when they bite you they infect you which is part of this world as well. The broader problem in The Walking Dead, the really radical change in The Walking Dead, is that everybody is already infected. And when you die, the zombie virus activates. So everybody is already somebody who has the zombie threat latent in them. It just needs to come out, and it comes out through death. Which is kind of the brilliant twist that the story gives us. Uh, not in the first episode, but it's, it, it's certainly significant to what happens in the story. But as we think about the first episode and, and who we encounter in the first episode, um, one of the things I would point out is that there, there are definitely some trends here. And there are some trends that relate both to the Romero tradition and there are trends that relate to what we'll call you know, the Halperin Bela Lugosi, much earlier tradition. And they're not neatly divided, but I think if we think about the films that we've watched in this, in this course, it can help us understand what we're seeing. So in the first episode, there's really two, set, there's two groups of people, right? So we have, we have Rick, who is surviving from his, uh, he's awakening from his coma, and then he's trying to survive in this zombie-ravaged landscape. And then we're made aware that there is this group of survivors who are on the edge of Atlanta, essentially, right? And they're trying to figure out how they're going to survive, how they're going to persist. And one of the things we become aware of is that Rick's wife, Lori, and his son, Carl, are part of that group, as is Shane, Rick's partner. And that they've somehow survived the initial wave of the, uh, of the zombie plague. When we think about that group of survivors and, and the decisions that they make and how it is they're trying to survive as a unit, I think we're immediately drawn to remember uh, films like, in this course anyway, um, you know, 28 Days Later, films like The Walking, Night of the Living Dead, okay, films like um, Day of the Dead. Um, we're thinking about movies where there's a group of survivors trying to understand how it is they can coexist and make their way in the world. Now, the difference, of course, here is that our survivors don't have any security, right? They're not ho holed up in a house um, they're not in a castle, they're not in a prison or something like that. They're literally camping. Uh, they're incredibly vulnerable to zombies wandering into their, their campsite. That idea of the group trying to figure out its group dynamics under the threat of zombies is very much kind of Romero, post-Romero zombie story. If we think about Rick and Lori, who they don't actually you know, see each other in this opening episode. I don't know if you've watched the series or not, but their story, the idea of, of the love story, okay, of the man and woman who are menaced by the zombie threat, in one way or another, 
um, with special urgency placed on the woman in the relationship, usually, is something that we've seen in a lot of earlier films, uh, going on from White Zombie to Revolt of the Zombies, you know, you know, zombies on Broadway. We see it in different ways, and it's not always the same kind of relationship, but this love interest at the heart of the matter is crucial to the zombie story, you know, I would say up to Plan 9, where it's too weird, or to Carnival of Souls, where it's not really there at all, and then Romero, but really up until... I Bury the Living, uh, which it really, I guess, isn't that big of a deal of there either. But we do have this significant tr tradition in the first couple weeks of this course of, of the romance being an important part of the story. And this idea in, in, in Walking Dead is that it's both romance, but it's also the story of family. Because we have a young boy, Carl, who's involved here as well. So that brings all of those kinds of kind of family dynamics, you know, to the story and to the storytelling. But all of that aside... If we just think about um, the world that's being represented in the first episode of The Walking Dead, and then this, this goes on in you know, episode after episode after episode, but if we think about kind of you know, the gritty um, nature of the world, one of the ways we might think about it in terms of the essays that we've read is that there's this idea of, of body horror, Right of bodies, um, you know, acting in ways that they should not be acting, doing things that they should not be doing under normal circumstances, being dismissed or showing horrifying mutation or transformation or something like that. There's all of that going on here, but what there also is going on here is a lot of really interesting representation of urban space in a state of destruction. So there's kind of this sense of ur urban horror or infrastructure horror going on in The Walking Dead, right? And which is very common to the post-apocalyptic genre uh, of storytelling. But usually in the post-apocalyptic genre of storytelling, you're coming to see a place long after it has been ruined, right? So I'm thinking of a series like, let's say, the Mad Max series, if you're familiar with Mad Max at all, where, you know, everything is destroyed and you're just seeing the very last vestiges of what used to be civilization hanging around. When you're looking at Atlanta, you know, not too far out from the zombie invasion, the hospital Rick wakes up in, the roads they travel on, um, the cars they either acquire or leave. What you're seeing is, is this really interesting representation of infrastructure decay, of world decay. So there's, there's body horror in terms of the um, walkers in the television show, but also pay attention to the landscape. Because that's another really fascinating thing. It's this idea of, you know, what would the world look like shortly after civilization and humanity falls? Now, this actually connects with a really interesting strain of what we'll call maybe, uh, 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 well, it's, it's science fiction, but there's a lot of really interesting stories that come out, documentaries you might be familiar with them. One of them is called The World Without Us. It comes out of a really famous book as well. Um, in the early part of last decade, in which writers started to think about, you know, what would happen if, what would the world look like if humanity vanished? Um, how quickly would things degrade? And it turns out it degrades really, really quickly. Um, what would happen to our infrastructure if it started to collapse? What would happen to our cities? What would happen to our urban spaces if nobody was left there to attend to them anymore? Okay, for example, one of the things we know about vast sections of New York City is that they would fill up with water very quickly because there would be no pumps to keep the subways clear and free of water. And nature's effect on the landscape would be, would be rather dramatic, but that there would also be some of these things that just would persist for a long time. So the iron infrastructure, things like that. So you, you certainly don't see all of that in the opening episode of The Walking Dead, but one of the things to pay attention to is the representation of the world and the physical implications for what would happen if people stopped living as they do, if society fell apart. It's fairly easy to tie that back to some of the aspirations and anxieties surrounding, let's say, September 11th, where the imagery of the fallen, uh, you know, the, the Twin Towers was so significant and in the front of so, so many people's mind for so long. Same with the Pentagon. Um, but I would also like to point out that that kind of, you know, urban decay 
um, is not necessarily new to the American imagination. There's films in the 80s like Escape from New York. There's the Mad Max series. Um, you know, the whole apocalyptic genre in and of itself kind of requires that the stories take place in a destroyed space, a boy and his dog, okay, an even earlier film. Um, but it's but it's certainly the case that that question of, you know, what, what would our world look like if we stopped attending to it? What would our cities look like if people stopped managing them? If everybody just left, if things just stopped, what would the world look like? And The Walking Dead kind of so brilliantly shows us that process happening, okay? Um, and as you go through the series, if you ever do choose to go through the series, which if you've made it to week seven of a zombie class, there's probably a good chance you're going to watch The Walking Dead at one point or another. Um, one of the things that we see over time is how this world falls apart. We see entropy in action. And so there's, there's, there's body horror in the sense of the zombies made very visceral with the girl with the crawling um, in the park in the opening episode of The Walking Dead, right? Severely destroyed body, still alive, very horrifying. But then there are some bodies that appear to be more normal than others. Um, we have, of course, a zombie horde here at the end when Rick gets into Atlanta, right? Um, and approaches um, um, uh, the tank. I think I'm in the right episode there. Um, but anyway, um, one of the things to keep in mind is that there's body horror and then there's infrastructure destruction. You might think of that as infrastructure horror. And all of this is occurring in the context of the zombie telling tradition. <coughs> so there's a lot of neat stuff that's going on in this film visually, this television show visually. There's a lot of neat stuff going on here that contributes to the zombie storytelling tradition that we have looked at in this class and thought so much about in this class. So I really hope you enjoy your time with this first episode, and I hope that as you engage it, you're re-engaging it with some of the many ideas we've thought um, about this term in terms of what zombies are, where zombies come from, what some of the significant themes have been, what some of the primary horrors are, and the difference between horror and terror, and how it is these, these different um, um, aspects relate to, of, the, of the gothic genre relate to The Walking Dead. So for example, you know, does the body horror of the zombies does that relate to, well, I guess I use the horror in the term, but does the infrastructure degradation, does that relate to some atmosphere of horror or terror in the film? If so, how and why does it do that? We might consider that as well. So there's a lot to consider. I hope you enjoy the episode um, and, um, um, and have a lot to say about it. And I look forward to hearing what it is you have to say.